Yo, what's good, everybody? Hey, I have some new goals for 2024. Trying to stay consistent. That's, that's the biggest goal so far. But let's get right into it. I'm not going to talk no more. Tinder, the worst dating app to ever exist. What the fuck are we going to watch today, bro? The, right. the world of online dating Rose can be Daily incredibly dangerous grinds. if you're not careful. While many people have had plenty of success finding love on these apps, too many have horror stories about a date with someone who... You know, it's kind of weird lately. It's kind of weird lately because recently it just became... I redownloaded Tinder. I've got no matches. Like zero. Felt like a bum. I ain't gonna lie to you. It was just sad. <laughs> it was just sad. I feel. Wait, I almost stop talking and just play. Who either wasn't who they said, or who was expecting to get something very different out of the date. While the internet is flooded with plenty of funny stories, some of these dates gone wrong have led to dangerous and even deadly encounters. So what happens when a seemingly fateful match turns sour? There are countless victims, trauma, torture, and even death stories. But in this video, we'll be going over some of the darkest dating app stories ever told. Introducing Grace Milan. While people use dating apps to find love or perhaps a quick hookup, few are just looking to find friends with similar interests. One of those people was Grace Mullane, and unfortunately, her quest for friendship led to a fatal encounter. Grace was a fun-loving, free-spirited young woman who had no trouble making friends. People were drawn to her light and couldn't get enough of her optimistic outlook. While earning a bachelor's degree in marketing and advertising, her family's success enabled Grace to work a part-time job and save lots of the money she earned. By the time she graduated, she had made enough to travel the world, a dream that frequented her mind as she grew up. She decided her career and the responsibilities of adult life could wait a little bit longer, like many of us do, and so after so many years of school and hard work, she deserved an adventure. And where better than South America, where she would spend six weeks exploring. Honestly, she sounds in a, like a responsible young adult. Just like, I ain't gonna say just like me, because I am not responsible. I ain't gonna lie to you. Bro, I am nowhere close to responsible. You may think that I can be trusted. I can be trusted. But now that we're a large group of people, I don't believe so. Eh, I lied. I'm better than most of these concepts. Not because I'm humbled by a small audience. So far. So far. Plan is to get this shit growing a lot bigger. A lot more. Enjoying the scenery, making friends, and living an amazing life. After an amazing- She does sound like a vibe, though. She does. I feel like that she got sex trafficked. She got kidnapped in South America. Sex trafficked. Killed off. In time there. Just, just a hypothesis. More hypothesis. She would then go to the next place, packing her bags and flying to New Zealand. A few days after oh, arriving, mind, she I traveled to lied. Auckland just in time for her birthday. She was alone in an unknown country and wanted to change that as quickly as possible. Nobody wants to spend their birthday alone, so despite being in an unknown country, Grace began the search for some new friends. She'd had success in South America, so why would New Zealand be any different? Wait, hold on, bro. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Question. I think I've heard about this. Wait. Yeah, I think I've heard about this story. This is the one where the dude, dude and her go into the hotel, hotel room together. And then she gets put into like a, she gets killed. They put her into a suitcase, right? I hope I'm right. It's one of the safest countries in the world, especially compared to South America. So she would use Tinder to quickly find someone who shared her interest to ensure a quick connection, allowing her to travel with a buddy. And after a few swipes, Jesse Kempson came across her screen. After a few messages, Kempson learned that Grace had no plans for her birthday, and so the next day, he immediately asked her out for drinks. While she said no at first, Kempson kept asking, and eventually she agreed to meet him. A few drinks with a local couldn't hurt anyone, right? Besides, she was in one of the safest countries in the world. What could possibly go wrong? 
The two met at Sky City, an entertainment complex in the heart of Auckland before heading for Andy's Burger Bar for cocktails. The conversation was slow, but the two began to warm up to each other over time. They moved from the bar to a Mexican cafe for a few more cocktails before eventually making their way to the Bluestone Room, where they ordered beers and were spotted sharing a kiss. The day was going well. So well in fact that Grace messaged a friend to let them know that she saw the potential for a great friendship. Since drinks had been flowing between them for a good while, and Grace was probably high- Damn. He's probably thinking of friendship and he's probably thinking of relationship. I mean, I'm gonna be completely honest, but he is not looking for for the side hug. Nah, nah, nah. You see this? His arm is around her, holding her this close, bro. He is not looking to just be friends. And spirits from the potential of a new friendship, she didn't really think twice when Jesse invited her to his apartment. But unfortunately for Grace, the CCTV footage from Kempson's apartment building's elevator was the last time anyone would ever see Grace again. You see, what she didn't know about her new friend was that he was a pathological liar and serial fantasist who had been kicked out of his family for lying. Have Honestly, this picture makes him look like a fucking weirdo. I think any of his other pictures will still be fucking weird as shit. No, 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 no. Why does he look like? Let me stop. Let me let me not go into the whole roasting session. I was about to get on his ass. Having multiple fallouts with several ex-roommates because of his threatening behavior, wild mood swings, and womanizing tendencies. Initially, he had told Grace he was an Absolutely. oil executive, but he was far from successful and had left a trail of failed jobs behind him. The day he met Grace was the day he snapped, and unfortunately, she was caught in the crossfire. At around 8 a.m. the next morning, Jesse left his apartment and brought a large suitcase with him, which he took to his apartment before leaving again at 8.32 and heading to the supermarket to buy bleach, rubber gloves, and cleaning supplies. While the bag alone wouldn't have raised anyone's suspicions, the quick purchase of cleaning supplies would have tipped off even the densest person as to what had transpired in that apartment and why Grace hadn't appeared again. He left his apartment twice more that day, once at 10.33, looking rather distressed in a taxi on the way to a rental company to pick up a red Toyota Corolla, and once later in the day, when the next day and his grand plan was to go on another Tinder date. While this happened, Grace's family and friends flooded her social What the fuck? I think I've seen this video before. Nah, it came out four hours ago. Is this fucking deja vu? It feels like deja vu. I mean, I was correct. Second guess, but like. Social media with birthday messages, but none were delivered because her phone was off. Those closest to her began to worry because they knew something must have gone wrong for her to remain this silent, especially on her birthday. And over the next few days, everything Jesse would do was caught on camera. And if it weren't for the horrifying. I think if I went missing, my family wouldn't notice. I already don't. I rarely answer my phone, and you'd be lucky if you called me a second time I answer my phone. But the first time, I'm most likely not. I barely even answer text. <laughs> you gotta be very important to me if I'm gonna answer your text or answer a phone call right away, bro. Dude, my best friend is like a brother to me, and he was like, you're so bipolar when it comes to texting. <laughs> when, it comes to, when it comes to texting or answering my phone, I'm just so bipolar towards that. It's funny because they expect so much more from me. In reality of what he was doing, his lack of awareness would almost be funny. You see, he was recorded parking his rented car, bringing a rented carpet clean to his apartment, and then returning it, and finally wheeling two full suitcases out of his apartment and to the rental car, which he drove down to Kumu, Auckland. In the morning of the next day, he headed for a building supply store and bought a shovel. 
Once Grace's body, which you can probably guess had been the contents of those two suitcases, had been disposed of, Kempson went home, dropped off clothing at the dry cleaners, cleaned up the rental car before returning it, and finally, on December 5th, got rid of whatever remained on Grace's belongings and threw them into one of the local park bins. But what Kempson didn't know is that the Auckland police were close behind him. Four days after her disappearance, they deduced that she was at the Star City Hotel, where they went to search for Jesse, who happened to be returning home. He was caught by surprise when he saw them in the lobby, and after a failed attempt to walk away unnoticed, which did nothing to help whatever little bit of innocence he had left, he was brought in for questioning as the authorities turned his home into a crime scene. His interviews went about as well for him as the investigation of his room. During the first interview, which he was lying through, the police used luminol, a chemical compound that revealed the blood Jesse had tried to get rid of. When he was brought in for further questioning, he tried to change his story and was promptly arrested for Grace Mullane's murder. Did you kill Grace Mullane? Jesse Kempson, you're under arrest for the murder of Grace Wallace. Investigators found her body a little while later in a shallow grave about 50 meters away from a country road. Bro, I don't understand. You're already fucking caught. You can't lie your way out of there right there. They have the evidence. They searched your room and everything. I don't understand why you're trying to lie about it. That when you know you're caught. You're caught. Pack your bags, you're fucked. You're probably going to be getting fucked in prison, but like, bro, like, let's be fucking honest with everyone. Let's be honest with everyone, bro. Why are you trying? Why are you trying so damn hard? Unless there's indisputable, unknown evidence against you, I understand. But if there's indisputable evidence, that says that you are the murderer. Why are you lying? There's a difference between just like accepting your fate and snitching. Accepting your fate it means like, oh, I did it. And I'm going to take responsibility for it. Snitching is like, all right, I'm going down. And that nigga over there is going down right with me. But like, what is the point? Road in a regional. I guess I'm trying to say I'm confused. I'm conflicted. I'm I'm more conflicted than Drake right now, bro. Regional park nearby, all thanks to surveillance footage, tips from locals, and Jesse's mobile data. But unfortunately, this wasn't Kempson's first offense. Eight months before he met Grace, he had also assaulted another British tourist after inviting her back to his motel room. He was also convicted for several other offenses against his former partner. And then, of course, he was found guilty of Grace's murder on November 22nd, 20 Oh, he's cooked! He's cooked! He is absolutely cooked! He's done! It's life! Unless he gets killed in prison! It's over! GG's! Her parents wept when they heard the verdict, and while Kempson initially showed no emotion, he began cussing out the judge, who went on to say he was further convicted for nine total charges of rape, sexual violation, threatening to kill, and assault. Hearing someone so bright, Nah, lock him up for life. Fuck Christ, that. Full of positivity, losing their life is incredibly tragic. However, hearing about someone who had been suffering for years and was on the brink of rebuilding their lives only for it to be unceremoniously ripped away from them is almost equally as sad. While Grace's death robbed the world of someone wonderful, the next person on our list story robbed them of ever experiencing true happiness again. Introducing Sydney Loaf. But before we continue, I want to tell you about Odo, the all-in-one management software that provides entrepreneurs with a ranging project and insurance. And even though you're putting in name for to build the use of the covet, skills for content, topography, clear, parts of your link to type builder, the best of all. Sydney Loof was a young woman who battled severe depression and anxiety, but was never without the support of her family and always tried to stay positive. She tattooed everything will be wonderful someday on her arm to remind herself that happiness was awaiting her. It would just take a little bit of time. Now in the weeks leading up to her demise, she told her parents, who always made an effort to keep in contact with their daughter, that it felt like her depression was getting worse. Hoping to alleviate Sydney's suffering, her parents arranged a doctor's appointment and drove to Lincoln, Nebraska to ensure she made it on time. With newly prescribed antidepressants, 
presence and the determination to have a better outlook on life, Sydney decided to try out Tinder, where she would meet a woman named Audrey. The two would go on a date and just drove around as they got to know each other. It was a perfect first date that would set the foundation for a potential relationship. Happy with how things turned out, the two arranged a second date. Two days later, on November 15th, 2017, Sydney was doing and feeling better than she had in a long, long time. Excited about the prospect of a second date, she actually posted a sweet photo of herself smiling on Snapchat, captioned, ready for my date. It wasn't a huge smile, but still, it was a smile nonetheless. And hey, she's, she's finally finding her personality. Yeah! I'm so happy for her so far, but I know this is going to take a dark turn. Wonder what's going to happen next. I, um, this is so shocking to me. You know what's fucked up? Being outside of a relationship and being unhappy at first, and then going into a relationship and that relationship makes you happy, but then it all be ripped away from you. So you're just in a downward spiral. That's fucked up to me, bro. Period. That's that's fucked up. I don't know, man. And one her parents would have been happy to see. Unfortunately, that would be the last time her loved one saw her smile. Sydney didn't know that Orgy was actually an alias used by a woman named Bailey Boswell. You see, Boswell rented a basement in a Wilbur duplex with her boyfriend Aubrey Trail, the same basement where Sydney and Aubrey's next date was supposed to be. When Sydney didn't show up for work the next day- Who the fuck makes a date in a basement? Are you out your colonizing mind? Who the fuck will want to make a date inside a basement? That's a red motherfucking flag to me. That's a red fucking flag. Why the fuck are you accepting a date inside a basement? It sounds like it, it should be. It's, bro, I can't speak because of how stupid that shit is. Bro. Come on. It sounds like they're going to throw you in a hole and scrape off all your skin once you're dead and just wear it as a suit. Like, can you be fully fucking serious, bro? Just be fully fucking serious. Because there's no, no, fucking, no fucking possible outcome that I would go. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just my melanin skills, my, my melanin nature. Or because I'm just a, I'm just afraid of almost everything in life thus far. But you you didn't you didn't find that suspicious at all. You didn't you didn't you didn't think about it at all. A basement date. Fuck no. The same basement where Sydney and Aubrey's next date was supposed to be. When Sydney didn't show up for work the next day, her family started to become concerned. Unaware that she had gone on a date the night before, they sent her a barrage of messages, and when she didn't respond, they drove to her apartment. The only sign of life they found was Sydney's cat Mimsy, who was alone, hungry, and seemingly abandoned. Assured that something was wrong, they reported her missing. Meanwhile, Boswell and Trail's landlord began complaining about the horrible stench of bleach coming up from their basement. It was so bad that a member of his family developed hives and started throwing up. It was also weird that they were running their air conditioner in mid-November. One of Sydney's friends was determined to find out what had happened and recorded her mentioning the name Audrey. So she made a Tinder account and swiped until she found Audrey and got her number. She then handed the number off to the police who at this point had determined that the last time Sydney's phone was on it had been- Honestly that's a W friend bro. Hey if I were to get murdered on a fucking date bro, if I were to get If I were to get murdered in the future, I would hope my best friends are to search out what killed me. Because I'm not no gang maker, so we can already get that out there. But I do have loose lips, bro. I, I will I will say some shit. Bro. And don't get me drunk either. If I get drunk, it's fucked over. It's fucked. Everything is out the window at that No, 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 no. Legit, I told this to my friends the last time I, I talked to them drunk. I remember because I fucking fucked up to the point of them after 
what the fuck did I say to him? First of all, I said I loved Michael. Tell about it. Then I said, because I'm cl I'm inching closer and closer to psychopathic ideologies to my friends, I said, if we were at a bar and somebody tried to fight you, bro, I'm instantly fucking them up. It doesn't matter if it's hands or if I got the bottle in my hand. They're getting fucked. It's gonna be a 2v20, and I'm gonna be right there, right next to you, and we're gonna be knocking every motherfucker out. <laughs> they said, Jackson, yeah, you can go ahead and sit down. <laughs> they just said, Jackson, yeah, you just go ahead and sit down. But that shit had me weak, though. But, like, I would hope, I would hope that they, that they will search for my, like, I will defend them if I, they were in a fight or anything. In, in Wilbur. They asked Audrey if she knew anything about Sydney's whereabouts using the newly acquired number. She admitted into going on a date with Sydney but claimed she dropped her off at her friend's house afterwards. They noticed that Audrey was hesitant to share basic details about herself and after a bit of digging discovered her true identity. She and Tro were named persons of interest and the police used their phone data to find a seemingly random location 60 miles west of Wilbur. And on December 4th the police found Sydney's dismembered body alongside sex toys and other items all wrapped up inside trash bags that Cheryl and Boswell Hold on, what the body fuck? alongside sex toys and other items all right you know i i said that i was itching towards psychopathic ideologies but really i'm, I'm not i'm i'm lying I'm I'm lying about that. Maybe maybe there's a couple of things that piss me off in the world. There's a couple of things that just I I can't stand. <laughs> PDF files, like hard workers, or like any normal shit that people are pissed off about. But. This shit is just super infuriating. Kidnap this guy. And then absolutely just violated her. You violated her and then killed her, chopped her up into pieces and discarded, tried to discard her like she was just a fucking toy. She was just a plaything. Why? Why do. I don't understand. Wrapped up inside trash bags that Cheryl and Boswell had thrown in ditches in a field near Omaha. She had been restrained before she was strangled to death, and some of her organs and body parts were never found. As it turns out, Cheryl and Boswell were a horrifically twisted couple who shared some extremely dark fantasies. Shortly after meeting each other, the two began a crazed cult and believed they could gain powers by torturing and murdering people. Before Audrey's second date with Sydney, the two had gone out to buy bleach and tools, evidence that led police to determine that Boswell had lured Sydney into a trap to murder her. And so the pair would be quickly arrested and charged in June of 2018. The prosecutors said that based on their evidence, the murder was premeditated. They were planning to kill someone before they'd found Sydney and only chose her after learning she lived 150 miles away from her family, hoping that it would take a while for her disappearance to be noticed. Fortunately for Sydney's family's peace of mind, they were close and in constant contact. However, terrifyingly, Sydney wasn't the first girl, and the web of crazy goes deep. You see, during their trial, three women came forward to testify about how they'd been lured in by Boswell and been forced to have sex with a disturbed couple in exchange for an allowance. They had to keep in contact with Trail, or he would punish them. Only one of the girls had the strength to leave, but she couldn't say anything for months because he threatened to kill her family if she breathed the word about her experience. Trail lied from the start, claiming that Sydney agreed to participate in their fantasies and that things had simply gotten too rough. At one point, he grew angry at how negatively his wife was being perceived and yelled, Bailey is innocent and I curse you all before slitting his throat. He was taken to hospital and returned to testify with scars in his neck. Sydney you know, I've been on this whole spiritual journey, right? Trying to find God. Uh, trying to limit my cuss words per day. But like, you out your motherfucking mind. Not only are you a fucking dumbass, or trying to lie about the actions. 
you've done it repeatedly, done it repeatedly, and then you try to be a fucking coward and kill your fucking self. Bitch, I will slap you upside your motherfucking face and I bet you won't do nothing about it. Motherfucker, who the fuck is this? Like, bro, I, I have no words for this shit because it's so fucking stupid. It, it's just so stupid. And it is pissing me off more and more I see this motherfucker. I don't know why. I don't know why. His face makes me angry. What? And he did nothing. But... Right. He was taken to... Look at his face. Doesn't that just piss you off just looking at his face? Bro. I... Bro. I don't know. Bro. He tried to kill himself because he wasn't getting his way. He bored. How fucking lovely. In the hospital, I'm trying to testify with scars in his neck. Sydney did nothing but reject my lifestyle and threatened to expose it, and I killed her for it. I could care less what you do to me here today. However, even after all of this, Trell admitted that everything he said was an attempt to confuse the investigators and claimed they'd only killed Sydney because she'd freaked out when they'd asked her to join them, and he needed to protect their lifestyle. I won't say I'm sorry, he said to Sydney's family, as that would be an insult to you after what I put you through, and I won't ask you for forgiveness as I don't believe there is such a thing. I've done some terrible things in my life, but this is the only thing I've ever done that I feel true regret about. So of course, if it was my family, it was my family. Bro. <laughs> they're gonna have to hope that I don't have to go to court that day. They they're gonna they gonna have to hope that I don't end up going to that court date. Because it's gonna be motherfucking hell in there. And I mean that with the full authority in my fist, my heart, my brain, everything. Catching every single motherfucking hit, and he's not even gonna see it. He might get choked out, and he might not make it. But well, he'll get choked out, and he will make it. Cause I'm gonna make sure that he stays alive. But motherfucker, you gonna go to jail? I'm gonna be right by your side. You gonna be my little bitch? Pause. No, did he? Hold on. Maybe I should cut that out, bro. Maybe my anger just. Ooh. I'm gonna be disaster. That's what I meant. Every single day, wake up, mock it, mock it, mock it, give me your ass beat. Before we go to sleep, you give me your ass beat. Just the couple was found guilty of first degree murder, criminal conspiracy to commit murder, and improper disposal. Oh, I'm petty, bro. <laughs> I'm I'm just straight petty. So like, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get it through your fucking skull, I'm gonna do it. Like my ex, I blocked her on everything. And I'm only going to unblock her when I have a, like a big amount of followers and actually doing my UFC journey and all that. Just, just so she can see that what she's fucking missing out. Matter of fact, not only am I going to unblock her, I'm going to make sure that i have all that and then send her my biggest videos and then send her my knockouts and then i'm going to send her my thirst traps yeah human That's remains. All I'm Cheryl was given the death penalty and the judges who ruled against him said that his planning had been cold and calculated and that he had even bragged about the murder afterwards and joked about drinking sydney's blood they also stated that the dismemberment of her body was unnecessary and they believed he had done it to satisfy his intellectual and sexual curiosity boswell also faced the death penalty and one judge claimed that her actions and words demonstrate that she had no regard why are they giving him the death penalty why are they giving him the death penalty you're giving them a way out. For the life of Sydney Louf beyond her own pleasure. But in the end, she was sentenced to life in prison without parole. While she didn't react to the sentencing, her attorney said it was an outcome they had hoped for. Hilaire was a 27-year-old single father and a hard-working man who cared deeply for his daughter. He was a well-known boxer in his community. And in 2016... I already feel sad. I already feel sad, bro. No, I look at situations like that. If you're a single father, a single mother, and you work because I come from a, I come from a single parent. So I'm like, seeing that, 
be working your hardest for your child, also trying to find love for yourself. It feels like nobody else is loving you. And then for someone to come and fucking take your your life. That's not okay. Like I, I feel for this dude already. Was on a quest for companionship on Tinder. He stumbled upon 18 year old Haley Bustos. After sending messages back and that's kind of crazy. Uh, you're very, you're very much cutting it close. How old are you, sir? How, how old are you again? Hilaire was a 27 year old single. 27. And she's 18. That's cutting close to Drake trials, brother. Haley Bustos. After sending messages back and forth and letting the chemistry build, the two agreed to meet in person on August 18th at a local bowling alley. Adam thought the date was going so well that he invited Haley back to his home, and it seemed she agreed because it was where they spent the rest of their date. At the end of the evening, Adam would drop Haley off at the apartment where she was staying. Everything was going great, and the romance was brewing. So a little while later, she would send him a message implying that she was interested in a second date. Assured that his date had been a great success, Adam was probably excited that she wanted to see him again. Little did he know the situation he'd find himself in. You see, after he drops her off, Haley had three people waiting for her inside the apartment. 26-year-old Andre Warner, 26-year-old Joshua Ellington, and 31-year-old Gary Gray. According to Haley, after she had told them what she'd seen in Adam's home and wallet, they began to hatch a plot to steal everything inside of his home. In the early hours of the following day, the four of them headed to Adam's home, Haley directing their path from the back seat. While she stayed in the car with Joshua, Andre and Gary broke into the house where they detained Adam holding him at gunpoint while they pillaged his home for all they could carry. Terrified for his life and the thought of his daughter living the rest of her life without her dad, Adam begged for his life, explaining that he had a five-year-old daughter. The criminals didn't care about the lives they were about to ruin. Bleeding tender. Bleeding tender, bro. I live in Fresno, California. So shit like this pops off. Because I met a psychopath. And she has a gang full of... She wants to be the thought of the group. Do this shit, bro. I'm not going to fall into that little Wayne Mona Lisa trap. I don't want to. That's why I'm an introverted person. I don't go out past 9 o'clock majority of the time. The only time that you're going to see me out inside of a bar or a club is if I'm with my rugby team. If I'm with my team and we did it for a certain reason, like a social event, okay, fine. I'll be there. But if it's some type of bullshit like I'm going to date you, kind of trying to see what's up. Nah, I already have anxiety when I talk to girls. When I talk to new people in the first place. Why? What? I don't want to fall into the Mona Lisa trap. They forced Adam to his knees and shot him in the back of the head, executing a man who had done nothing but take a pretty girl on a date. Andre and Gray then headed back to the car and the group fled the scene with a few hundred dollars of stolen property and the blood of an innocent man on their hands. They sold Adam's belongings the next day, with Haley reportedly getting a 50% cut for her involvement in the operation. So weird. Fuck all four of these motherfuckers, bro. Fuck them. And so they quickly sped off from his home, fleeing the scene. But shortly after the brutal killing, Adam's roommate found his body and called the police, opening a murder investigation. And the police had like fucking cuts. Blah 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 blah. Fuck that game banging, cock sucking, wannabe hoe, fucking dumb ass bitch, and fuck her friends too. No suspects until a few weeks later when Haley Bustos was caught during another burglary and a witness's testimony led to her arrest. She was then linked quickly to Adam's murder, and after a little bit of questioning, the detectives on the case had the names of her three associates. You see, in court, it was determined that Haley had participated in what's known as a honey trap. This particular operation was using the Plenty of Fish dating app to get close enough to vulnerable targets to scope out their homes and determine whether they were worth robbing. Haley confessed that a friend had encouraged her to download the dating app because it could be used to lure men in and exploit them for money. During the trial, Haley was then found guilty but offered a plea deal that would 
keep her from life. So not only was she a part of it, she also snitched. From prison, if she snitched on the three men she had assisted. During her testimony, Haley revealed that the men had laughed when talking about Adam begging for his life. They didn't see a man desperate to see his daughter grow up. All they saw was a weakling that they could unload a few rounds into. He told him that there was checks <coughs> in the car, and just to take anything, but just not take his life. Now Haley clearly felt a bit of guilt about what happened, because while testifying, she said I really didn't care if I spent the rest of my life in prison as long as he's behind bars too. Warner tried to claim innocence, but ultimately he, Joshua Ellington and Gary Gray were found guilty of first degree murder. Warner sentenced to life in prison with the jury recommending the death penalty for his actions, and for her cooperation, Haley was charged with conspiracy to commit armed robbery, robbery and theft and sentenced to serve 25 years for her involvement in the robbery that led to Adam's death. So next time you're doing online dating, maybe always double think about what crazy situation you could find yourself in and make sure you're careful. You don't want to walk. All right. That was. I think I'm deleting Tinder after that. I just. Love of my life. I don't get married. But with that said, you guys, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Like it. Alright, now, peace. <laughs>